Good day and welcome back to Chemistry Videos. My name is Clarissa Sorensen Unruh and we're going to be talking about academic self-efficacy some more today in terms of re resourcing. So academic self-efficacy resourcing. You have several resources available to you, and they are in any class. Any class that you take at the college level will have several different resources available. Sometimes they are static resources. And static resources for me mean things like um, books. You have your textbook or other books that might be helpful. You have articles, journal articles, if you're in a higher level class. You have the internet, right? You have these resources that are out there that are available to you that don't tend to change that much, unless you're talking about the internet and maybe a lot, a lot of things change it sometime, okay? Then you have people resources. You have your friends. You have folks who, if the friends, if your friends don't include someone who has taken the class before, then the idea here is to make as many friends as you can in college or try to resource yourself to people who have taken the class before. With previous class experience, which we used to call upperclassmen, but may or may not apply for you. So you would get to know juniors and seniors in their coursework, and the likelihood that you found someone who had taken that class before grew, okay? And you have your professors or your TAs. This might very well include TAs. Previous class experiment experience almost always includes TAs, SIs, peer learning facilitators, supplemental instructors, uh, teaching assistants, all of those people have probably taken the class before because that's why they're in there, to be helpful, okay? In terms of resourcing, the internet tends to be the first stop place and often the most dangerous, okay? So if you're using your textbook, you're using articles, those can be safe bets to some degree, especially if you're looking for articles on things like Google Scholar, Google Scholar, and so on and so forth. The internet tends to be the most dangerous because you Google it, and then you don't use Google Scholar, you just Google it, whatever your problem is, often the exact question you're having a problem with, and then you might get to sites that are like Wikipedia or something along those lines. That's not so helpful, folks. Wikipedia is really good for certain subjects. It is not that great in other subjects. So for like for statistics, my statistics professor came in the very first day and said, Wikipedia is great for this. And I was like, okay, that's safe to use. If your professor says it's safe to use, that's great. If I were gonna talk about chemistry, there are parts of Wikipedia that are amazing for chemistry and there are parts that really suck. It's hard to tell which one. So you're gonna trust for the most part, .edu websites, .gov websites, um, those are the most common, unless it's something that's well known that everyone has a sense about that is generally accepted. So like for instance, Khan Academy tends to be fairly vetted and so that tends to be a really acceptable place to go, okay? There's uh, math sites that are well known to be very good in terms of um, their content. So, but you're gonna try to stick to places that are .edu or .gov. The libraries sometimes have collected things. There's a whole library grouping where they've said for chemistry, here are acceptable websites. Look into your libraries and see whether they have that available because that narrows things down very easily. But not everything on, as you probably know, not everything on YouTube 
is great and not everything that you come across will be helpful. And some things on the internet are totally wrong. <laughs> and so just because it's on the internet doesn't mean you can trust it. More of the time, because they've been vetted by peer review, articles are very good, books are very good. Okay, past that. Friends are good to be able to get some resourcing ideas from, to bounce ideas off of, but students with previous experience in the class are by far the most helpful. The reason why is because they might have notes that they're, available, that they're willing to share with you. They might be able to tell you some things about that particular professor. Those are by far the most helpful folks. And I'm not talking about the people who go to RateMyProfessor.com because RateMyProfessor.com has a mishmash of people who might be really happy with the class and people who might have dropped and decided to totally bash that professor. And it happens more with women professors than it does with men. And we've done studies on this. So just FYI, that's not the best way to get information. The best way to get information by far is from your TAs, from your PLFs, from your SIs, from people you know, you know have taken the class. Get their notes, get their homework sets, get their, uh, possibly if they're willing to share them and the professor doesn't mind, their exams. Get a sense of what that class is about and start looking at it early and often so that you can get a, get a good sense. Professors should be approached with caution. Um, professors are gonna want, they want to help you. Many professors out there want to help you. Some professors don't. It's just the way it is. Many professors want to help you and they schedule office hours to be able to help you with your problems. But when you go into a professor, this is a sign of respect to be completely and utterly prepared and have tried that problem in every way you can before you walk in the door. That's what we're talking about, okay? It is not a great question to go into a professor and say, I don't understand anything that's going on. That is very confusing for the professor. They don't know where to start explaining things. That's very confusing for you because then they're trying, if they're trying to actually answer that question, which newer professors do sometimes try to answer, they're trying to answer a ridiculously large question in a re really small amount of time. And that's not really gonna help anyone, okay? So just FYI, professors are the ones that you go in and since they're, to, they're helping you with your grade, they wanna help you, but go in with very tight, focused questions that you have already tried multiple ways. It's a sign of respect to them. It's a sign that you are caring about this material and trying it out. It is a sign that you are a good student and are worth investing some extra time in to make sure that you have everything uh, absolutely clear so that when you go to that exam or the midterm or the final, you have no worries. You don't have anxiety about what's going on. All right, folks, until next time, adieu.